Hi, my name is Mina. Welcome to Kids Talk Church History, a one-of-a-kind podcast where kids investigate the history of the church. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Has he kept his promise? How has Jesus built and preserved his church against all odds? Come with us on a trip through history to find the answer here on Kids Talk Church History. Many of us have heard of John Wycliffe and Jan Hus as forerunners of the Reformation. That means they were people who had many of the same questions and ideas as those who started and carried out the Protestant Reformation of the the 16th century. They were people who saw some serious problems in the church and wanted to fix them. But Wycliffe and Hus were not the only ones. The Middle Ages were full of people who had the same concerns. Stay tuned as we meet some of those people today. I'm Trindy, I'm 16, and I live in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm Linus, I'm 13, and I live in San Diego, California. I'm Lucas, I'm 15, and I also live in San Diego, California. I've read something about John Wycliffe and Jan Hus, but I don't know if all our listeners are familiar with them. Can you explain who they were? Well, Wycliffe was a priest and a professor who lived in England in the 14th century. At first, he just complained about how the church had become rich and political, far from the message and example of Christ. Also, at a time when popes and councils were arguing over who should have the final say, Wycliffe and the Bible, Wycliffe said the Bible should be the only authority. In fact, he promoted the translation of the Bible from Latin to English so everyone could read it. Yes, I've read that he became even more radical, arguing that the Bible doesn't talk about purgatory and that during the Lord's Supper, Jesus is definitely present, but the bread and wine stay bread and wine and don't turn into the actual body and blood of Christ as the church was teaching. That's when he made most of his enemies. He really sounds like one of the Protestant reformers. Yeah, he even condemned the practice of granting indulgences like Martin Luther. For our listeners, I'm going to read the glossary from the church history book. Indulgences are documents issued by the Roman Catholic Church promising a shorter time in purgatory for those who meet certain requirements. Yeah, in the Middle Ages, you could get an indulgence by going on a pilgrimage or even paying some money. And the promise of a shorter time in purgatory could extend to others. For example, a person who was worried that a loved one would spend too much time in purgatory could get an indulgence for them. The Roman Catholic Church today still talks about indulgences, but they don't sell them. Wycliffe just thought that the church didn't have the power to save people. Maybe our listeners don't know what purgatory is because we don't believe that in Protestant churches. Well, according to the Roman Catholic Church, purgatory is a place or a state where sinners can be purified by punishment until they can merit going to heaven. And it's not specifically mentioned in the Bible, so I understand why Wycliffe was against it. The other famous forerunner of the Reformation was Jan Hus. He lived in a region called Bohemia in today's Czech Republic, around the same time as Wycliffe. Like like Wycliffe, he pointed out many problems in the church, but Wycliffe had some powerful friends, so he was able to die a natural death while Hus was sadly executed. Did he also translate the Bible? Yeah, there was uh, an already there was already a translation of the Bible into Chez, but Hus and some of his followers uh, revised it during their time. And who were some of the other forerunners of that time? There are many, just not as famous. For example, a German named man named John von Wessel and a Dutch man named Wessel Gansfort both spoke against the practice of indulgences for the same reason as Wycliffe. They didn't think the church had the authority to make those promises to the people. They also said that only the Bible had authority over the conscience of Christians. Gansfer also said had the same view of the Lord's Supper as Wycliffe. And I'm sure they lived happy and long lives. Well, not really. John Von Wessel was imprisoned for life and Gansfort was able to die a natural death. His last words were, I know only Jesus, the crucified. There are many more examples of earlier formers, and these are just some of them. But we have here a wonderful expert who can tell us more about these early reformers, Dr. Audrey Southgate, lecturer in history at Lincoln College, Oxford. Dr. Southgate, thank you so much for joining us today. It's lovely to be here with you.
Um, so you've heard our short introduction. Is there anything that you would like to add or correct? Mm. No, I think that was all great. It was lovely to hear to hear such a such a a succinct but also clear summary with all the important details. I mean, I think the thing that I'd that that you've you've mentioned, but that I'd really emphasize for both Wycliffe and Coos is that they really emphasize the importance of having the Bible and uh, of having it in people's own languages and, and having preaching in people's own languages. So Wycliffe's followers, we don't know most of their names. They went anon- anonymously, um, presumably partly because um, they, they uh, knew that they might be persecuted, uh, but we do know some of their names. Um, they would go around the countryside preaching in English, and same with Hus himself, preached in English at the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Uh, and that was that was a big emphasis in, for both of them. Yeah. That's cool. I've read that one of your areas of expertise is about the Lollards. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Lollards. Yeah. The, Lor- yeah. the Lollards, the followers of Wycliffe. Can you tell us something about them? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't I didn't think of this till just now, but uh, their name. There's some different accounts of where that comes from, uh, but one of them that I think is I think is the, the most interesting is that it comes from the idea that they uh, would were singers um, and and preachers, and so la 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 la. It's a lot of make, a lot of sounds that they made. So lollert um, is is what they came how they came to be known. That's cool. <laughs> but then. Uh things were quite different for the followers of Hus, the Hussites, right? Yes. Uh, it, it, that, that one, it's a complicated story with, with the Hussites. Um, we've got lots of examples where, um, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just go back a step because, it, because there's, there's such a long story there. Hus was really influenced by Wycliffe. Uh, he was like Wycliffe, he was a theologian, a scholar in the, in the university, um, in Hass's case, there in Prague. And uh, he, he um, was really influenced in particular by, by Wycliffe's call for reform. There was a concern uh, at the time over something called simony. You might remember the story of Simon the Magician in Acts, who tries to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad to see these knowing looks. That's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the practice of simony would be when church officials tried to buy and sell church offices. Mm-hmm. Both Wycliffe spoke out against this, and Huss found that really resonant. He was seeing that in in the church in Bohemia, and lots of other Bohemians were concerned about that too. Um, so that was that was just one of the concerns. Another one was that that people didn't have access to the Bible, and that that the authority of of the church and what it said, what those those priests who were practicing simony was being held above the authority of the Bible. That was also a big concern. Um, so yes, he he was really influenced by those ideas and and wanted to wanted to call for reform as well. Um, one thing that happened, um, it, in, or one, there were lots of uh, different conflicts going on in the in Bohemia at that time. Um, so including conflicts within the within the university in Prague between German faculty and Czech faculty. And there, so Hus got ca- caught up in some of those disputes, um, and uh, the, the the Czech the, the the Czech members of the faculty tended to be more pro reformers. The Germans tended to be against it, and the kings the king got involved, and the Germans left, um, and that made Hus the the rector of what was now the Czech University. Um, Around this time, sadly, two of his friends one 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 was his teacher, um, and another was an, a fellow student of his ended up um, being being called up by the by the papal curia uh, to and being challenged for their reformist ideas, they're the challenged for for asking for reform. And actually when they when they were brought to brought to that interview, um, by the time it was over, they'd actually given up on their ideas for reform. So that was a that was a big loss or who's that his friends were no longer with him in that. There's there's so, so many more stories I could tell, but I don't want to I don't want to just yammer on forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So I know that Hus wrote many books while he was in exile. Do we know the names of those books? Yes. So he, uh, just to clarify, one of the reasons that, that we think that he wrote so much in exile was that he wasn't preaching. He was usually preaching um, in, in Czech at the Bethlehem Chapel. Uh, but, but when he was in exile, he couldn't preach anymore. Um, so one of, those, one of those that he wrote actually was a Latin work on the church um, and in, in which he talked about uh, the importance of the church being under scripture and these sorts of things. But he also wrote lots of things in Czech, including commentaries on the Ten Commandments, on the Pater Noster, or you might, might know that in English as the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. Um, he wrote lots of Czech sermons. He wrote a text discussing the issue of simony um, that I've mentioned. So very, very, very prolific. He used that time since he couldn't speak, preach to people in person. He wrote to them. We also have some, some lots of letters from him from that time. Um, I mentioned that Wycliffe promoted the translation of the Bible from English or Latin to English. Who actually <laughs> translated it before? Yeah, so this is one of the big questions. Um, for a long time, people thought, okay, that was Wycliffe's translation. Um, but we don't really have any direct evidence that it was his. He wrote an awful lot, and I think people feel, feel like it's hard to believe that he could have translated the whole Bible as well as writing all those other things. Uh, the other thing is we don't have any other example of him himself actually writing in English, even though that was a big part of the of the Lollard movement was preaching and teaching and providing the the Bible in English. So um, we don't know exactly who, who did make the translation. We suspect it was a team just because of how much work was involved. Um, understandable, it's probably understandable that people didn't necessarily want their names to be associated with the translation. So it, nobody kind of signed, phew, I finished this, um, <laughs> this book. Uh, but a couple of the names that have come up as possibilities um, are a man named John Trevisa, he was someone who did a lot of translation from Latin into English in that period. Um, a couple other names who, whose initials appear in, the, in certain manuscripts are John Purvey and Nicholas Hereford. All three of those people were, were um, distinguished scholars um, here in Oxford, actually. They, uh, John Purvey and Hereford were here. Um, so it's probable that there was a team working together, again, probably here in Oxford, uh, using the resources of the university, all the books that they had here, not just the different copies of the Bible in Latin, but also lots of commentaries on the Bible to support their translation work. Um, did the Bible be, or yeah, did the Bible become main or widespread in England? Yeah, there were, um, there were lots of copies. Uh, we still have over 250. That's, that's pretty much more than any other medieval English text that we have. Um, so that's, that's saying something. We have lots of copies of the Wycliffe Bible. Um, and they weren't all actually necessarily owned by Lollards. We have lots of examples of clergy, monks uh, owning these Bibles, even lots of royalty. So um, kings from Richard II to Henry VIII had copies of the Wycliffe Bible. Um, and you have to remember that Henry VIII wasn't always a fan of the Reformation. He had that, he had that Wycliffe Bible even before the Reformation. Someone else, another royal figure who had a copy of the Wycliffe Bible was um, a queen, the qu a queen Anne of Bohemia. Um, so she actually came over from Bohemia. And we th the fact that she had this Wycliffe Bible and other, other Wycliffe materials suggests that she may have had some interest in or contact with certain Lollards. And um, it's thought that maybe the people who brought her over for her wedding were the ones who brought back the influence and the writings of John Wycliffe back to Bohemia. So mm. That's an interesting little connection there between these two figures. So when the church attacked the Lollards, I know that they burned their Bibles, but were there some remaining or did they completely wipe all those Bibles? Out? Yeah, so I mentioned before that we still have 250 copies that we know about of, of the Wycliffe Bible. There could be others we don't know about that, are, that still survive. Probably the fact that there's that many that survive suggests there were even more back in those days. And it's not just Bible, the burning of the Bible that would have, uh, that would have 
reduce the numbers. Also, you have things like things getting left in in damp places and getting eaten by bookworms and mice and um, things like that. So, so, th- so there were probably lots more, but there still are a lot that have survived. And like I said, um, it seems like the authorities were actually very often willing to turn a, a blind eye to the to to people owning the Wycliffe Bible. Again, even people who weren't necessarily interested in reform for themselves found it helpful because if they were if you're a, if you're a clergyman preparing a sermon and your Latin isn't very good, it's really helpful to have an English Bible. Even if you don't think that everyone should have access to it, you're very glad to have that yourself. So I've seen uh, Wycliffe's name spelled many different ways. Do we know how he liked to spell it? And then what's your personal favorite spelling? Um, Ooh, this this brings up the whole question of spelling, which isn't just a church history question. It's kind of a big history question. Um, the So back, at, back in the Middle Ages, spelling wasn't standardized. People just spelled things the way that they sounded. And because people had different accents in different parts of England, um, they spelled things differently if they were from different places. Um, so Wycliffe's name could be spelled differently depending on how he thought it sounded. And Wycliffe himself would have spelled it different different ways at different times. Um, so I, I tend to go for W Y C L I F, but you can you can you can go medieval and spell it however you like. Um, I'll just mention again. This is just another fun fact for you. Um, Who's had all sorts of influence on Bohemia, what's now the Czech Republic? Um, one of the things that he that he wrote was actually, in addition to his works on theology, he actually wrote a book about um, orthography, which is spelling. So he was really interested in how do you spell Czech and, and simplifying that and making that clearer. So these people had all kinds of interests that uh, you can see how that would relate to making the Bible and good teaching available in in the language of the people, and 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 it also had to do with um, trying to to expand access to learning more generally, so that people would have the tools not just to read the Bible in their own language, but to understand it. Um, so lots of lots of interesting things there too. Um, we know that you've studied how the Psalms were used in the Middle Ages and specifically what Wycliffe and the Lollards did with the Psalms when they translated and taught the Bibles. What did they do with the Psalms? Yeah. So like, like you said, as you know, they translated them and they didn't just translate them once. They actually translated them several times, which I think is really interesting because it suggests that they were aware that you might need a different translation for a different setting or purpose. So they have one translation that's, um, I don't even want to say literal, it's just so close to the Latin, it almost feels like it would be something that you could use right next to the Latin if you were trying to work out what the Latin said, if you had a copy of the Latin Bible and you thought, oh, I, I'd, I'd like to be able to work this out. One of their translations would be really helpful for that because it it uses kind of a Latin word order, which is different from the way that we say things in English. So in English, we, we tend to say, my cup is on the table, whereas in Latin, you might say, on the table is my cup. Um, so one of their versions is happy to follow that 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 word order that sounds odd in English because it's closer to the Latin. Another one is a bit more what we call idiomatic. It sounds more like the way that people speak. Um, they 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 also had um, they didn't just translate the the t- the text of the Bible though. They also thought about how how people would be taught with it. And I think you could say this is kind of another aspect of translating. So. The word translate um, in Latin, it means to, to, to carry over. And so I think any teacher is carrying over learning from one generation to another or from, from, one, from one setting to another. So other things that they did, um, they, uh, they, they translated some of the Latin materials that explained what the Psalms meant. So there was this idea in the Middle Ages that the Psalter contained in it um, Everything, everything that the Bible teaches us about God, but in kind of in, in, in an abbreviated version. So they thought of it as a theology book. Um, and so they had lots of, of, of notes uh, in the in. They provide lots of English notes in the margins explaining what do the Psalms say? Theologically, they provided lots of notes in the margins um, about different ways that they could have translated a word. Um, they didn't have access to the Hebrew. They only had Latin. The Jews had been expelled from England. So there weren't people that they could learn Hebrew from, and there weren't very many Hebrew books. 
but they but they had access to commentaries that said this is what the Hebrew says, um, and so they tried to provide notes on that. So that's a bit like study Bibles today. You probably have a study Bible at home that has um, has notes in the margins or on the bottom explaining things. Another thing they did um, is they made that I think is also again an extension of translating the Bible is is they provided versions that had um, what you might call devotional notes. So in addition to thinking of the Bible as a, as a, or of the Psalter as a theology book, they also thought of the Psalter as the hymn book of the church. Um, and that probably is something, something I did that won't be too unfamiliar to you. Some of you may sing the Psalms in your church sometimes. Um, and and, so, and they, they thought of that as, as a book of prayers that you could, that God was teaching us in the Psalms how to pray to him and giving us the words, the very words that we could speak back to him. We, we could speak God's word to him. Um, and so they, they kind of would provide one verse and then expand it into a long prayer um, and things like that. So they, they, they were clearly spending a lot of time with the Psalter and it was really impacting both their theology and, and devotional life. That's cool. Can you tell us a little more about the way people read and sang the Psalms in the Middle Ages? Uh, yes. So the first thing is all the time. <laughs> so people, people use the Psalms a lot. In fact, so sometimes you'll have, um, if you, if you read all kinds of medieval figures or people bef before the Middle Ages too, like Augustine, if you read their books, you'll think, where do the Psalms end and where do their words begin? It's hard to tell where they're quoting from the Psalms and where they're just speaking. So it's almost like it's, that's, that's their language that they speak is Psalm. Um, so, and, and part of the reason that that, that that was the case was that, that it was so much a part of people's lives, especially anybody um, who was able to write, they would have had a certain upbringing and training. So most people who learned to read and write would have done that in the context of the church. Often that started by being by by being um, part of part of part of the the monastic um, life was saying offices. So that's little services throughout the day, or sometimes actually not very little long services throughout the day. And monks would go through the whole psalter in a week. Um, so that's that's lots of psalms. Oftentimes, when children learn to read. They learned to read by reading Psalms because it was assumed, well, you already have these memorized from reciting them every day. Um, so if you learn to read them, uh, it'll, it'll be learning to read something you already know. So it, they, were, they, were, uh, they were really familiar that way. In, in the period of Wycliffe and Hus, you have a lot of interest from lay people, that's people who aren't scholars, who aren't theologians, who aren't um, pastors and preachers and members of the clergy. Um, who are interested in, in trying to have a holy life and they're seeing the model of the monks and they're seeing lots of time spent in, in, in prayer at specific times of day and they think, oh, I want to be part of that. And so there, there are books made for them to be able to recite the Psalms throughout the day, sometimes in a slightly simplified form. Usually that would be in Latin. And this is one of the, the big topics that we come to with Hus and Wycliffe is um, the issue of Latin and the vernacular. So vernacular would be English or Czech, the language that you learn from your mother rather than the language that you just learn at school. Um, and the Psalms in church were, were said in Latin. You, I think people understood them more than we sometimes give them credit. Um, so if you think about it, if I said Gloria, you probably know what that means. Any guesses? Glory. Yeah. <laughs> so well, lots of words become familiar over time, especially if you hear them a lot, but it's also true that people didn't understand everything that was going on, um, and so, so that was that was one of the issues that that the followers of Wycliffe and Hus and his followers wanted to address. There are we do have some examples of of books of ours, so books of those psalms and prayers to recite throughout the day that were translated into English for um, lay people, people who weren't cl clergy, particularly rich lay women, really like to do that. But we also have examples of lawlers who memorized big parts of scripture, including the Psalms. So I've read that who sang Psalms while he was being burned at the stake. Do we know which Psalms he sang? Yeah, um, we we do actually. Um, and the story of Hus's, um, 
martyrdom is actually quite a powerful one. It's obviously very sad and difficult in a lot of ways to read about because it's so, um, I mean, so, such, a, such, a, such a difficult way to die. Um, but he, the, the two psalms that he sang were Psalm 51, that's the one that starts, have mercy on me, O God. That's David's psalm that's asking for God's mercy after he sinned with Bathsheba. And then, um, and that was a very common psalm in the Middle Ages. People really loved the penitential psalms, the psalms that ask God for his, for forgiveness. So at the end of his life, he just wanted to, to ask, make sure that he asked God for forgiveness. And then the other one that he sang that we know about is... Um, Psalm 31, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. And that includes the, um, that's later in that psalm, you have the verse, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And that's, I mentioned a little bit about those, the monastic offices, those daily prayers. In the, in the last office of the day, Compline, be- right before you went to bed, you would say that verse, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. As you as you ended the day, so those were those are the two psalms, um, he said at the end of his life. So I know that Hus had to appear before the Council of Constance. Mm-hmm. I was just wondering why did he why did he appear before them? Because I I would think uh, well it's probably it's probably a trap. Yeah, well I think he would be right, um, and and yes, absolutely. I think he perceived that too. And he was very hesitant to go, actually. Um, so there were two things that, um, that, that, that as, as far as I know, that uh, were part of, of convincing him. Um, the first, I'm going to have to go back and give a little bit more context about, about Hus um, and the kind of the, the growing conflict about him. One of the things that happened was um, that as... Uh, as after he after he argued against indulgences, actually debating with one of his own former students, um, there was a, there was an interdict placed on him. So that that meant that nobody, um, in his case, it meant that nobody near him. So if he was in an area, nobody in that area could have communion or baptism or other or the other sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that was a huge problem. Obviously, people people appreciated the, the, the high importance of communion at that time. And also, they really appreciated the importance of baptism. Um, and because people died a little bit more often, than and often earlier than they do now, um, they really were concerned to, to, for instance, baptize babies before they died. Um, so this is quite a scary thing for an interdict to be placed on you. Um, so this had happened. Um, and when 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 Hus was summoned to the Council of Constance and was thinking, oh, I'd really rather not go, um, his king, King Wenceslas, was was started to be threatened. Hey, you're not keep you're not observing that interdict. You're not keeping that rule. Um, so 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 one thing was that Hus wanted to, in some ways, it seems, protect um, King Wenceslas, or or maybe he perceived that Wenceslas couldn't protect him. The second thing was that uh, the king of Hungary, who was calling the Council of Constance, King Stanislas, promised who something called safe conduct, um, and this is this is the this is the idea that was that um, the idea was that he that he would be given safe travel, um, and there and back, and um, of course. This is not what happened. <laughs> he got there, and 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 he he hadn't been protected at all. And one of the interesting things that that he um, that he wrote in one of his letters as he was waiting for his execution, what he called his um, dreadful death. Um, he he wrote about how Christ provides safe conduct, and I'm gonna re- I'll read a quote to you from him just because I think it's so beautiful. Um, What God promises his servants, he performs. What he pledges himself to give, he fulfills. He deceives no one by a safe conduct. No servant who is faithful to him does he send away. So I think that's quite a powerful contrast that Hus was able to appreciate between the way he was being treated by human beings. He He knew that he couldn't put his trust in princes and the way that he knew he could put his trust in the Lord. Yeah. 
Something else I'll mention here is that he did make his will before he went, so I think he kind of knew that that was coming. It's uh, it's very interesting. I've also read that the Moravian Church is a descendant of the followers of Jan Hus. So is it still similar to the Hussites, or is it different? Yeah. Um, so the Moravian Church started as a group um, inspired by the Hussites in the mid-1400s. Um, and and they, th some of their focuses were simplicity of living, nonviolence. Um, they were really emphatic about, about the Bible in Czech. Also hymns. They used, wrote a lot of hymns and use those. Um, and they uh, were able to pursue, after the Reformation, they were able to pursue good relations with both Lutherans and Calvinists, and, and some of them were unified with the, with the Lutheran Hussites. Um, and then after the Thirty Years' War, they ended up in um, ha ha having to either be reunited with the Catholics, which some of them did, or leave, uh, leave um, their area, um, Moravia, which is a part of the modern Czech Republic. Um, and that that region, uh, and so they they ended up in Germany. You might have heard of 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 a, of, of a town called Hernhut in Saxony, or a man named Nicholas of von Zinzendorf, who wrote a lot of hymns. We don't really sing them very much because they were not in English, but um, that but they 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 had a they had a, a, a pious community there. One difference from so they they also were the Moravians were big leaders in missions. So actually, one difference between the Moravians then and now is that. Most of the Moravians now are in East Africa, not in Moravia. <laughs> um, so that's that's uh, one difference. They, they've all they also really emphasize now, as as they always have, I suppose, life over doctrine. So living like Christ rather than believing a certain thing. I've heard so, that many scholars don't like to call Wycliffe and Hus forerunners of the Reformation. Can you explain why they believe that? Yeah, so some of it, and I confess this as a scholar, is that scholars um, are very picky about language and maybe even persnickety. Um, so they want to be really careful about not saying something if you're not clear what it means. Um, and what does it mean for them to be forerunners of the Reformation? Does that mean they had all the same ideas as Luther and Calvin and other people? Luther and Calvin didn't have the same ideas as each other all the time. So which side would they be with? Um, so that's part of it. For me, part of it is also that I want to take Wycliffe and Hus on their own terms. So they didn't know the Reformation in in the 1500s was coming. They um, they just saw the problems of their own time and were calling for reforms in their own time. And so I want to I want to understand understand them for themselves what they said. Um, obviously, the question of how that influenced later people and how those later people um, looked back on those people and held them up as examples. So Fox, um, a famous English Reformation figure, John Fox, and you might have heard of his book of martyrs. He spoke a lot about the Lollards. So obviously there's an important connection there. Um, but I but I would want to be careful uh, not to just lump them all together like they're all part of the same group, all, all trying to do exactly the same things. Why aren't they as well known as the 16th century Protestant reformers? Yeah, this is a good question. And you never know why one thing is popular and another thing isn't, right? One thing is, of course, that the, that the Reformation is more recent. And um, so it's a little bit closer to our own lives. Um, another thing, I think, is that um, sometimes you have centuries of developments and thought and people building on each other. Um, and it's only it's only when you kind of, when, when, when the last piece is put in or the the... the um, the, the last straw finally breaks the camel's back that you notice it um, or that it becomes that, that you, 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 you attribute it to the person who broke the camel's back. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, that's, that's, that's the best example I can think of. There's a great a quote from um, a man named John of Salisbury um, who said that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so oftentimes you see the person who's on top because they're up the highest, but that's not because they're not, that their height isn't actually all their own. And I think that might be the case with um, some of these developments.
So coming back to modern times, I've I've seen that uh, you teach at Emanuel Christian School in Oxford. Uh, what do you teach and for what ages? Yeah, so I teach, I've taught various things um, in the time that I've been there. I've taught history and um, music. Those are some of the main things. Um, something we called pictures and poetry, which was lots of fun too, looking at pictures and poetry, like like it says on the tin. Um, something that I'm doing, teaching right now that's new that I'm really enjoying um, is a class on time in Anglo-Saxon England. So the way that people thought about both the church year and the seasons and the ways that those connected and how they express that in poetry and art and lots of things. So that's a class for um, what here is year seven and eight. So that's kind of 11, 12, 13. Um, the other classes I've taught to kind of ages four, four to 11. So that whole age range. And uh, now just the uh, last two questions that we ask all of our guests. Mm -hmm. How did you become interested in church history? And if you could meet anyone from the Middle Ages, who would it be? Ooh. Um, so part of how I became interested in church history was just by being part of the church growing up and by being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And some of those witnesses introduced me that I, that I knew and that taught me Sunday school and that I went to their house for dinner. Some of those witnesses introduced me to witnesses that I couldn't go for dinner with because they weren't alive anymore. Um, and that was partly through books. Um, you guys might have come across um, Richard Hanula's book, Trial and Triumph. That's a favorite of mine um, that I really enjoyed. Uh, actually, I read, I remember reading a, a book on Wycliffe when I was quite young called Morning Star of the Reformation by Andy Thompson. So those were two things that, that, um, that I read uh, that kind of cultivated my interest. But I think honestly, a lot of it was just that, that we talked a lot about church history um, when we were thinking about what it meant to be a Christian. Uh, we were, I, I feel like I was, I was really grateful that um, the people that I looked up to, I saw them looking up to other people too, them looking at other giants and people who trusted Jesus and followed him in difficult times in the past. Um, if I had to meet one figure from the Middle Ages, I would really struggle. I struggle with favorite questions. I have to tell you this. Um, so Jan Hus would be one. I think I think he'd be really interesting to talk to. I'm not sure I'd really want to meet Wycliffe. I've, I've spent a lot of time reading his stuff. And I think he's brilliant, but I think I would find him really scary, um, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I'd, I'd love to meet, and this isn't really a church history figure, um, I'd love to meet Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, I think he would have been a lot of fun to talk with, uh, but he also is someone who maybe would have had deep insights hidden beneath his hilarious exterior. Um, yeah. The other person I'd really love to meet would be Julian of Norwich, because I think she thought a lot about God's goodness, even when the world doesn't look right. And I think that's, I'd, I'd, I'd just love to chat with her about that. Uh, and then uh, just one last thing I'd like to add on to the, Joffrey Chaucer thing. I just had to write a paper on the Knight's Tale. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Fun. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> it's good. To, he's like I say. He's he he can come across as really kind of silly, but but there's actually quite a lot there. I think. So, uh, finally, are there any books about the Middle Ages that you would recommend for young listeners? Oh, I guess I already I already mentioned them when I was describing my own story. Um, the Trial and Triumph and by Richard Hanula and Morning Star of the Reformation by Andy Thompson were the, were the two I mentioned there. Um, there are there are loads out there, actually. Um, Simon Carr has written lots of great materials that I've, I've really enjoyed using, actually, as a, as a history teacher, because they're so well-researched, um, but also really fun and interesting. So that there's, there's, there's so much out there. Well, Dr. Southgate, we are so thankful that you decided to spend this time with us and we really learned a lot. Thank you for the answers that you've given us. Um, it was a really, it was a pleasure meeting you and talking with you. I feel just the same way. It was such, such a pleasure to speak with you guys and a privilege too. And I hope, I hope to hear more from you in future podcasts. <laughs> As usual, listeners have an opportunity to win a copy of Simonetta's car 
Carr's book, Church History, which includes information on the church in the Middle Ages. To enter the drawing, submit your questions or comments to questions at kidstalkchurchhistory.org. Again, that's questions at kidstalkchurchhistory.org. You can also find the link to our, on our website, kidstalkchurchhistory.org. While you're there, you'll find past episodes, special news, recommended readings, and more. And if you would consider making a donation to support the work of the Alliance and podcasts like this one, we'd really appreciate it. In partnership with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and on behalf of my co-hosts, Linus and Lucas, I'm Trinity. Thank you so much for listening to Kids Talk Church History. <laughs> <laughs>